All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are ready to get started with the hackathon. So now that we finished the morning session, so this is going to be a more uh, just informal session to explain about what we're looking for, answer questions from you guys. I'm probably just going to, can you hear me without the microphone? I take this and I'll just sit down. Perfect. Um, so goal of, of right now, I'm just going to get straight into it. Um, the goal of the microphone. We need the microphone. You do need the microphone? OK. Yeah. thought my voice was louder than it was. Uh, so goal of, of this afternoon, whoops. Uh, goal of this afternoon is uh, to be able to give you the, the info that you guys need to be able to build solutions uh, find out what the needs are, learn about the tracks, answer any questions um, quickly. We just have about 20 minutes right now, and then we'll come around to you and we can um, answer questions in more detail. Uh, but to, to get straight into it, so there are four different tracks. Uh, we have, have up on the website, I believe, it had the, the distribution of, of what those tracks are and, and what people are registered to be competing. On, I think we had about 50% of teams that were looking to compete on that third track is, is what I remember, at least from a couple of days ago. Um, I don't know, is Claire or Stephanie, are you here? You know, they can fill you in. I mean, it's just something to think about strategically if you, uh, how many of you right now, raise your hand if you're signed up or if you're thinking about track one, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, maybe have one, one person from each team. How many from track one? Okay, just a, a couple at track one. How many track two? Okay, we've got a few more. Track three? Yeah, so we got a lot, a lot more track three and track four. We've got, okay, a good amount of track fours also. So that'll help you just to think about um, just logistically of you know four four winners across across those different tracks now track 1 the the first two tracks are software application solutions um, with these solutions we're not necessarily looking for integration of any kind of data feel free to use data that you want but we're really looking for um, development of a software application so ideal here would be um, a prototype, like an alpha of, of a, a software platform, some working prototype that, that you could be able to demonstrate when you give your presentation. Um, you know, it could be, so you could show mock-ups, you could show designs, comps of something, but even better would be um, an actual workable prototype. Um, and this would be it would be an application or interface to facilitate data sharing among different stakeholders. So for example, um, there are, you heard this morning from a, a number of different groups, you heard from uh, the perspective of patients and families who patients themselves may be willing to provide access to their own data. That would be really helpful if they were able to do that but there are a number of risks and ethical issues that um, have to take place in doing that. You know, think about Apple and HealthKit and, and the types of issues that they encountered in coming up with that. Um, same types of issues need to be understood in order to make a, patients and families sharing data, make them aware of the risks. So what would that look like? What would the application or interface look like? We also, so I'm a public health researcher, we want to be able to, to analyze data. We want to run regressions. We want, to, um, we want to take data and put it into statistical programs or, um, or use our big data tools and integrate it with that. Um, how would we, as researchers, be able to have access to data? Um, what types of data and what would it look like? What would be the interface for uh, researchers? There are public health officials who are actually taking action and need to be able to understand trends and, and what is happening in 
you know, as close to real time as possible, what would their interface look like and how might they share, um, share their insights or share data um, along with these other stakeholders? So these are the, the primary stakeholders that we're talking about. Um, and this would be the, the emphasis of track one, being able to create some software uh, interface that would allow each of these key stakeholders to be able to be aware of, uh, of their issues, their, um, their concerns, and, and something that would be helpful for them. This is very, um, from my understanding with, with uh, different key stakeholders, is this is very relevant. Um, California Department of Public Health has just received a lot of funding around opioids to create a platform to facilitate data sharing. And they have, I think they had said something like a couple uh, hundred million dollars to change around their infrastructure and create the infrastructure on this. And, and are concerned potentially if they create a new infrastructure software system like this, um, what might that do to their existing software infrastructures? And so these are the types of, um, these are the types of concerns to, to think about. Uh, second, second track is focused on designing personalized behavior change apps that can be applied by patients, families, and or providers of health systems for long-term reductions in overdose-related risk behaviors. Key word here is on long-term. So I'm, by training, behavioral and a behavioral and social psychologist. Um, we're really good at being able to get people to change their behavior once. Um, to, to nudge people to do something once, but we are not very good at figuring out how to get people to stick with things. Um, there are a number of studies um, on this topic of how we get people to stick with things, uh, and this second track would be expected to integrate that research and those insights of how do we get people to not just do something once, but be able to stick with it. Um, so the, the idea would be, again, mock-ups or comps or, um, you know, that would be fine, but even better would be a workable prototype of something that shows the user interface and, and allows the walkthrough of that, of, of something that could be used for, among patients in recovery, for example, how do we keep them in recovery and not dropping out of recovery? Because dropout's a major issue. How do we keep them taking medication-assisted therapies um, when we talked this morning about stigma and all these barriers to continuing to take therapy, um, continuing to stay in treatment? That would be the, the focus of, of track two, software application. Now, tracks three and four, those are focused on on data science and visualization. And for these two, I will, um, I will also hand over to Dr. Willis and, and, uh, and Jeff Chen, Dr. Chen, uh, right here, um, to be able to provide additional insights on the, both the public health department's uh, perspective as well as the needs from, um, as well as the needs from uh, cannabis researchers and potential of alternative and integrative therapy approaches. So these two tracks, this is where the data that we are releasing are relevant. Um, and we provided, raise your hand if, if you are thinking about track three or four and you do not have access to um, the data sheet that we provided with data. Everyone should hopefully, okay, great. Everyone should have access to that right now. Um, so, so with, with these last two tracks, we, we will expect, um, so at least models, models looking at the relationship between opioid related outcomes and um, you know, some predictors or some, some models. Um, even better would be a visualization that's powered by these modeling methods and these visualizations, you could imagine, you know, let's say you're a health department and you do not know how many overdoses are occurring. You do not know how much, you know, 
Um, people don't know where to get naloxone. You, don't not, you do not know how many, um, how many opioids are being prescribed. There could be a visualization tool that could provide you with you know, as close to real-time information about that. That would be very helpful. Um, three of the areas that we talked about this morning um, were off the top of my head. So one of them was focused on medication-assisted therapy and bringing insights into um, where and how medication-assisted therapies are being used. Um, second is on, um, is on harm reduction and how do we find out about where, um, where naloxone is available or other types of alternatives um, to combat overdose. And th the third priority area would be on prescriber behavior. How do we understand rates of prescribing of opioids um, and, and or have support or tools for things that can help reduce prescribing of opioids? Those would be the, the three primary areas of tracks for this third track where we would be looking for models and even better visualizations to be able to support that. Um, and then track four would be focused on um, very similar to track three, but uh, would be focused on integrative therapeutic benefits and approaches. So again, um, models, uh, even better visualizations with an understanding that track four will be more exploratory than track Three, we, we don't have the same confidence or understanding in track four. And so that's why this is exploring new integrative therapeutic benefits. You know, an amazing outcome that could come from this would be finding relationships between cannabis or between yoga or meditation and opioid outcomes that we didn't know about before. That would be an amazing insight that could happen from this, from models or visualizations. Um, the, so what makes track four different from track three is a requirement that any team competing in track four must use in what I'll call an alternative data source. Uh, so by alternative, it means not just the typical public health sources of data on overdose or on um, prescriptions or whatever it is, but integrating, um, we have we have companies that have provided cannabis data. Um, there are, um, if and you're welcome for any of these tracks. You can provide your own data, or use your own data as well. You're not restricted to the data sets um, we've given, but you would in your presentation need need to be able to describe where you got your data set. Um, you would need to, if you used a data set we didn't prescribe or didn't uh, um, present you with, you'd need to be able to share the data set for the judges, for them to be able to see it and validate it. Um, and, uh, but you're, you're welcome to, to bring your own data, especially if you have VR data, AR data, um, blockchain data, things like that. Um, so again, this, this fourth track, the difference is that it's really focused on on uh, ha requirement of either uh, of some alternative data source. Um, it could be uh, cannabis, yoga. Um, in our own work at UCIPT, we've done a lot of work with social data, like social media data, Google Trends data, Twitter data. Those would also be considered alternative data sources as they're not typically the traditional public health data sources. So if you have access to those, um, you know, Twitter, Firehose, things like that, you could also be able to analyze those data sets. Um, okay, with that, I will, um, let me first ask, uh, uh, let's ask Letitia, let's ask Matt Willis, anything to add on these first three tracks? And then Jeff, anything to add on the fourth track? Hi everyone, um, so I'm Matt Willis, Public Health Officer from Marin County and I also work with the state in the Opioid Safety Network, working with um, county-based coalitions to address this issue um, and also as a, as a primary care doc myself. Um, first I wanna say that I think the, the work that you're gonna do here today and tomorrow is gonna actually save lives. 
um, which might sound like hyperbolic and exaggerated, but in fact, um, I think we have so much work to do um, and our systems, the epidemic we're experiencing right now is the result of the systems that we've created historically and we need to remake those systems and it's gonna be through this kind of work. Um, so thank you in advance. Um, the, just to, to sort of imagine me as a user of the products that some of you might generate. I'm a health officer, so I sit above 250,000 population and I'm trying to prevent overdose deaths and addiction in that community. I don't have access right now to the information I need to do that effectively. For example, I'm not able to tell you how many overdoses we had in, the, in our county with any sort of reliability in the last week or month or even two months ago. I need to wait right now for the state to offer me a report that's about, about six months delayed to tell me how many overdoses occurred at the local level. The problem with that is that overdoses are like communicable disease events, which are reportable to the health department, and that one predicts risk for another. So that if you actually know when it happens in real time, you can get out there and actually predict, predict someone else from having an overdose event because of the fact that like bad batches might come into the community of something like fentanyl that's very high potency, is exchanged through social networks. One event becomes predictive of subsequent events. And right now we are flat footed in terms of our ability to see those occurrences when they're occurring so that we can get out there and save lives. So that's one of the... This idea of sort of the predictive analytics, there's some very practical needs around that that um, I think we need some help. Um, and then the, from the physician standpoint, as a, as a primary care physician, one of the, I think, most important, I asked our primary care docs, you know, after letting them know that I was gonna come talk to you, kind of what, what do they need help with most? And it's actually two things. One is non-opioid pain management. The reason patients are being prescribed opioids is that they are having pain. Physicians care about their patients and that relationship is important. How can we help patients feel cared for and how can we feel as though we're doing good by our patients when we're not prescribing opioids they think they need for the pain that they're experiencing when we don't have an alternative? So that whole notion, and it's part of track four, of sort of effective alternatives for, for pain management is really important. And then treating people who have addiction. So helping primary care doctors acquire the skills, the abilities, the knowledge to actually be effective in treating patients who are now being recognized as having opioid use disorder um, for addiction treatment, medication assisted therapy. So those are my quick pitches of, kind of what I see from my perspective as our highest priorities. And I can't wait to see what comes out of this team and I'm happy to answer questions. Hello, everyone. I won't spend too much time reiterating what's already been said, but I did want to take a couple of minutes to uh, have you imagine a victim of human trafficking. Um, she comes in with the intersection of opioid abuse um, because her trafficker has told her that she has mental health issues and that she needs pills. We don't know how she, she's getting the pills. We don't know um, if there's a prescription and we don't know uh, much about her except for that she's 14 years old. Um, she hasn't been to school in, in multiple years and that she probably, uh, that she was picked up on a subway um, selling uh, candy or cookies or some, some type of perfume. She's a victim of labor trafficking and without the information on her, um, we know very little about her. Um, thank you for giving me this off. I wanna switch forward, or I don't have to, if you can go to the next slide. Um, the, the key thing about Sarah is that she comes and presents at a health, uh, um, a nonprofit organization that's funded by the Department of Health and Human Services with multiple issues. They could be in the realm of mental health substance abuse. Perhaps she's had multiple sexually transmitted diseases. She might also need care, um, school, education, all these things. But because we're not talking as one HHS, we miss an opportunity to serve her needs in a comprehensive manner, which is, Hence, the reason for the HHS data sharing project. Um, in order for us to get the right kind of data and accurate data, we have to be able to pull those, that information in from multiple systems. Um, and the other issue is we cannot wait for a survey um, that's comprehensive over a longitudinal, um, uh, maybe a year, two years, after the data has cleaned, when the epidemic of human trafficking is um, needs to be in 
in a predictive pattern. Law enforcement is picking up the victims, but actually that victim may have sought health care as they were being trafficked. And so we've missed multiple opportunities to share with them. So how this is relevant to the op opioid crisis is that in the very first piece here, the very first assumption is that she's been told that she needs pills. So we see someone who has this and that, and that basic mental health therapy is not going to work because of the type of trauma and types of issues that she's been experiencing for a very long time. So ultimately, um, for the Department of Health and Human Services, it's about social determinants of health. I don't know how many people have heard of it, but it's very comprehensive. It looks at the individual, um, the environmental factors, the community factors, and these are things that are predisposing factors that can help us actually predict a pattern of whether or not Sarah will actually be trafficked. One of them is whether or not she's um, a, a homeless or runaway youth, whether or not she's in, the, uh, in child welfare, and we can't pull that together fast enough because of the disparate systems. So if you can imagine that your role today, even looking at op the opioid crisis, has a major impact on our ability to find Sarah in a timely manner before she experiences much more trauma than she ha already has and get her to the right resources so that she can uh, be self-sufficient and fulfill a well-being, a healthy outcomes for her well-being. Um, the other part of that, and I'll just add to this, this last slide, <clears throat> we have very basic questions about human trafficking that cannot be answered because of the lack of data. <clears throat> the other part of that is the technology when we're talking with Dr. Willis and he's saying that we don't have the systems, they don't have the money in order to do this. When we say add on this other issue to your already data system, and by the way, we can't give you any money for that. Um, that's a real problem. So what we have to be able to do is make the case for evidence-based policy making by saying here's a gap and that is being supported by some of the learnings that can be advanced quickly through a hackathon. So we're really excited about what you all are able to accomplish. Um, we're thankful for your thinking. We're, we're grateful for your new and fresh eyes on this perspective and, and we look forward to whatever comes out of this. And just to end very briefly on, on the, the why cannabis is important in this data set. And so again, you know, you heard from my talk, there's more, going back to what um, was mentioned previously about different parts of the chain that lead from someone to become potentially dependent on opioids all the way to an overdose, right? So oftentimes it's in the context of chronic pain. Uh, how could you, so how do you cut that off? How do you prevent someone from becoming dependent on opioids by inventing good solutions to chronic pain? For those who are already dependent on them, how can you help them through the, uh, the withdrawal portion? How can you help them remain abstinent, right? And so uh, what we have data sets today for related to cannabis is we have, uh, for the first time ever, we actually have, we've been working with a cannabis market research firm to generate uh, data on the amount of uh, THC that is sold in different localities, as well as the different product distribution sold. Um, and what you might, and if there's a dose dependent relationship, and that's certainly interesting, and, and what, what's the actual outcome of this? Well, if it appears that given certain products, certain types of cannabis products sold might be more protective against opioids, and that's certainly something that you could have a regulatory decision made uh, to, to uh, favor uh, one type of product over another. Also, if you find that dispensary locations in a different uh, county might be protective against opioid overdoses. Well, that's another push from a regulatory standpoint. If you have hotbeds of opioid overdoses in a given state, locating dispensaries there might actually be a good thing, uh, potentially, based on the data that you guys find today. And the real, the last thing to pull this all together, the, the interesting thing about cannabis as an intervention, as a treatment, is the notion that it is a naturally occurring product. So what does that mean? It means that it's cheap. Right? There's a reason it's called weed. It's because it grows wild in many parts of the world. So you're talking about a, a scalable intervention, right? An intervention that you can scale not just across the country very easily, but across the, the nation or across the globe if needed. But that really depends on what you guys find today. So for that last uh, integrative therapies track. So, alrighty, thanks. 
All right, thank you. So we are, we are ready to go. Um, we are going to, we're, we're at 145 right now, right on schedule. For everyone who, who wants to begin, we're, we're ready to begin and um, Claire and Stephanie will get you started. For, for anyone who wants to stick around here, we can continue and answer any questions and have a Q&A. So we don't wanna hold any, um, any teams up for those of you who are ready to go. Um, anyone who wants to stay here and ask specific questions, you're welcome to. We'll also um, make some rounds around and, and try to answer questions as we go. Um, and I'll, I'll just add, building on what, uh, what Dr. Willis said, I believe and, and hope, and we're putting this on, I think all of you are, are going to have an impact. You're going to save lives. Um, we have amazing advisory committee and stakeholders um, here to help you. And, and my role is, is really to try to help so that each of you can create a solution that can be implemented. And I will do whatever I can um, to try to find the right people, help you, advise you in any way so that you can create some solutions that will be implemented to help save lives. So with that, uh, we're a, we're a quiet, quiet group and we're, we've got a long road ahead now for the next 24 hours. Everyone stand up, let's stretch and just let out, let out a, a yell or something. I'll do it with you guys, let's go. Oh, come on, come on, come on, let it out. One more time, one more time, one. Two, three, oh, all right, all right, everyone.